Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. It's entitled, Personalized Cancer Treatment and Patient Stratification Using Next Generation Sequencing and Other Omics Data. Virtually every life scientist and biotech researcher will tell you that the future of healthcare is synonymous with personalized medicine. Nowhere is this more so the case than with cancer, which is truly unique to every patient having to deal with this disease, or should I say, diseases. Today's webinar has been designed to demonstrate how the data gathered by next generation sequencing, along with the application of diverse omics techniques, might shed light on new ways to tackle cancer and other diseases. More specifically, our panelists will discuss how more appropriate drug response biomarkers for patient stratification might be obtained and how better drug targets for individual treatment might be discovered. Let's meet our panel. Dr. Ralph Stahel serves as a professor at the Clinic for Thoracic Surgery and at the Poly Clinic for Oncology at the University Hospital of Zurich in Switzerland. In addition, Ralph is president-elect of the European Society for Medical Oncology, also known as ESMO. Ralph is going to demonstrate how advanced non-small cell lung cancer represents an excellent example of the transition from standardized to personalized treatment in oncology. Dr. Martin Edelman, Professor of Medicine and Director of Solid Tumor Oncology at the University of Maryland Greenbaum Cancer Center, will expand upon the discussion on the personalization of therapy in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. He'll specifically address the optimization of current and future drugs. And Dr. Yuri Nikolsky, Vice President of R&D, Intellectual Property, and Science at Thomson Reuters, will describe methods for the functional analysis of omics data for personalized and translational medicine. I'm John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of GEN, and I'm going to serve as moderator. Please feel free to enlarge the slide images or download the complete presentation. At any time during the webinar, you can send in a question for our panelists. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. The panel will try to answer as many as possible during the question and answer segment that takes place after all the presentations have been made. So if everyone's ready, let's get going. Dr. Ralph Stahel will be our lead off presenter. Ralph? Thank you, John. The aim of my presentation is to demonstrate to you how the treatment of advanced cancer has changed from a standardized approach, meaning one size fits all, to a personalized treatment. What is a personalized treatment? I will demonstrate to you in the example of advanced non-small cell lung cancer. So in the past, the treatment decisions for patients with advanced lung cancer were made on clinical characteristics age, performance status, comorbidities. But personalized treatment now also takes into account molecular tumor characteristics. Thus, we are moving away from an empiricism and serendipity to a biology-based treatment. We want to match the right drug with the right cancer type. Also, we want to define on each patient's tumors the biomarkers of response to targeted agents. In the first step, it has become evident in the mid, about five years ago, that for the diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer, this term, non-small cell lung cancer, is no longer acceptable. We need to know more. We need to know the specific histology of the tumors. Why is this the case? It's the case because the benefit of bevacizumab added to first-line chemotherapy has only been demonstrated in non-squamous cell carcinoma, and the label is thus. Also, it has been shown that Pemetrex, an anti-cancer drug, is active in non-squamous cell lung cancer, but has less activity in squamous cell lung cancer, and thus its use is restricted nowadays to non-squamous cell lung cancer. Importantly, however, now histology also helps us guide decisions about molecular analysis to be performed on the tumors. 
Lung cancer can be divided in three major parts, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and a smaller group of non-small cell lung cancer, large cell type, which is not going to one or the other box. Adenocarcinoma on its own, though, is not a uniform disease and needs to be subclassified further by addition of molecular analysis. At present, these molecular analyses need to include EGFR mutation status and the determination of EML4 ALK fusion gene. However, there are a lot of emerging opportunities of targeting other oncogenic drivers, and there are technological advances in molecular testing that will lead to a shift from the sequential testing of EGFR followed by ALK to a more combined testing by multiplexed or next generation sequencing. Now, this is for adenocarcinoma, which is the largest group of non small cell lung cancer. However, now potential driver mutations are also being identified in squamous cell lung cancer, and in the foreseeable future, these tumors also will need to be tested by molecular analysis. Now, going to the situation today in Europe, the European Society of Medical Oncology has produced guidelines, including this pocket guideline, which gives the algorithm to approach patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. It comes from the patient with metastatic disease, the differential, as I said, to squamous cell carcinoma or non-squamous cell carcinoma. For patients with squamous cell carcinoma, the standard treatment is still a chemotherapy, as it has been in the past. For patients with non-squamous cell carcinoma, we standardly now examine mutation of the EGFR gene or ALK rearrangement. For patients who have one of those two characteristics, there is a specific treatment available. In Europe, EGFR treatment is used as a first-line treatment. Patients with ALK rearrangement still are first treated with chemotherapy, and this is then followed by a specific treatment upon relapse. Why are we enthusiastic about those new treatment approaches is shown in this presentation from Dr. Mock, which was first shown at the ESO meeting in 2008. It describes patients who have an activating EGFR mutations in their non-squamous cell lung cancer. Patients on the left side sign, mutation positive patients were treated either with cefitinib, an EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor, or combination of standard chemotherapy. And it was clearly demonstrated that the overall tumor response was much superior for the targeted treatment. Patients on the right side had no demonstration of an EGFR mutations, and here the standard chemotherapy is still the appropriate approach. Since this pivotal demonstration by Dr. Mock and colleagues, seven randomized studies have been performed targeting specific patients who have in that tumor and activating EGFR mutations. All seven studies showed a double, if not higher, response rate for the EGFR targeted treatment versus standard chemotherapy and a very dramatic longer progression-free survival. It's because of this study that now the recommended testing for all patients is an EGFR mutation test, and if this test is positive, an EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibition as the first treatment of choice. However, despite this, in all these randomized studies where data is available, the survival of patients who had a first-line EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor followed by chemotherapy or the other way around was not different. Now, was, this was a, raised a lot of controversies. Is it really appropriate to give the first-line EGFR targeted treatment? And the fact it is, all those patients who had initially chemotherapy virtually all had a crossover to the targeted treatment later on, but their quality of life, as assessed by the patient, was felt to be superior if cefitinib in this case or allotinib in the other studies were the first choice. Also, response is much more rapid, and one has to realize that not all patients who have first the chemotherapy can be successfully crossed over to the more active targeted treatment because patients may be too ill at that point to receive the appropriate treatment. 
Now, the question still has been come up, do those targeted agents really provide a survival benefit? And yes, they do, and in a dramatic way. These are data from Japan, and they just look at survival of patients with EGFR mutations on the right part of the panel. And it was survival of patients before approval of gefitinib, so before patients could have access to the targeted treatment, and survival after improvement. And the survival with the targeted treatment for patients who had a targeted treatment was double than the survival with standard chemotherapy. We suspect in the community that the increase of survival is even greater because at that time we didn't have the detailed knowledge on how best to use the targeted agents. So it's quite clear the targeted treatment in non-small cell lung cancer for patients with an EGFR positive tumor has provided a substantial survival benefit. Also an example that all those targeted treatments so far for patients with advanced disease are very effective, but also with time there will be development of drug resistance. And how to overcome drug resistance is currently a major focus on research. This is a lady, 58-year-old. She had an adenocarcinoma of the lung, which later was found to be EGFR mutated. She was started on standard chemotherapy at that time, which was cisplatin, pemetrex, and bevacizumab, and had a very good tumor response after four cycles of treatment. And as is recommended, bevacizumab maintenance treatment was continued until disease progression, which was in March 2010. The treatment started in February 2009. At that time, we knew the patient had an activating EGFR mutation, and she was treated with olotinib, had a very good and traumatic response, fully functioning, back to work. And this response lasted from July 2010 until January 2012, when the patient became ill. She couldn't work anymore, and the tumor showed progression in the lung and also in lymph nodes. Now, what is known nowadays is that the best treatment in this situation is a first-line chemotherapy. So the patient received a combination again of carboplatin and pemetrex, had a very good tumor response, and then was maintained on a lotinib treatment until October 2012. Now here, the patient again had a relapse on the targeted agents, and we went back to chemotherapy because of the toxicity we seen earlier just to temcitabine. I don't have a CT scan yet, but the patient again responded, and we will switch back to the targeted treatment. So it's a disease course from February 2009 till January 2013, over four years, and the patient still again now is fully functional and fully working. What we've learned that patients who had a very good response to the targeted treatment, one should be very careful to withdraw the targeted drug. This data shown from the Memorial Hospital that when patients are stopped the targeted treatment, up to a quarter of patients have a disease flare, which can be quite dangerous. It can be associated with hospitalization. It can also have some mortality. That's why nowadays a big discussion is to vein out the targeted treatment very carefully before switching to chemotherapy. As I said, how to overcome resistance to the targeted treatment is a major focus of research. This slide just demonstrates in a very simplified way how resistance can develop. So a patient with an activating EGFR mutation has a good response to the targeted treatment cells undergo apoptosis and the tumor shrinks and fades. However, there may be secondary mutations present in the tumor and cell clones with secondary mutations prevail, again leading to a relapse. Alternatively, the tumor cells find other way to escape the targeted treatment because other receptors than epidermal growth factor receptor, for example, the MET receptor can be amplified and so overcome the signaling that has been inhibited by the targeted treatment. Alternatively, also, ligands can be highly expressed hepatocyte growth factor. A ligand of the MET receptor has been demonstrated to be overexpressed in patients who develop resistance. All these 
insights and many other of types of research this way give us a hint on how to overcome drug resistance. A clinical study has nicely demonstrated the frequency of mutations and alterations that have been associated with resistance to EGFR inhibitors. The most dominant resistance mechanism was a secondary mutation, T790M, a resistance mutation, which made the cell not respond anymore to allotinib or cefitinib. MET amplification I have demonstrated, but it has also been shown a transformation to small cell lung cancer be associated with drug resistance. So moving this field, we go to another way of targeted treatment which has now entered the clinic in the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer, and this is ALK-positive non-small cell lung cancer. In the year 2007, it was first demonstrated that a patient with adenocarcinoma of the lung had a transformation, a translocation of an EML4 and ALK fusion gene, and it has been demonstrated that this fusion gene was an oncogenic driver, meaning it was responsible for the tumorigenesis, an essential key event. It was shown in mice models and then in vitro that there are drugs available to inhibit the ALK kinase, and these drugs have then rapidly entered clinical practice. The drug that is available now today is called crisotinib, and in the very first study, an expansion of the initial phase one study, it has been demonstrated that with crisotinib, Patients who have been refractory to all kind of standard treatment had a very dramatic response if their tumor was ALK positive. So almost 60% of the patients had an objective regression of their tumor, and many more patients had clinical benefit from treatment with crisotinib. That is, has proved to be very excited in the field, and in the ESMO meeting and last fall, the first randomized study was demonstrated, again now comparing the effect of crisotinib with standard chemotherapy. In contrast to the study I demonstrated before with EGFR, this study was done in patients who had a relapse after standardized chemotherapy. Patients had to have an ALK-positive tumor, and they were randomized to crisotinib treatment or the standardized chemotherapy, and as can be shown here, it has been a dramatic difference in response to crisotinib versus the chemotherapy. It has been shown even within the chemotherapy group, there appeared to be one drug, docetaxel, to be less active than Pemetrex in the treatment, but both drugs are clearly inferior to crisotinib. Now, all these studies have led to an approval of crisotinib first in the States for any line of treatment and recently also by the EMEA in Europe for second-line treatment of patients who have a non-small cell lung cancer with an ALK translocation. The question is, how frequent are those translocations? How frequent are those mutations? EGFR mutations in Western societies have a frequency of about 10 to 15%. In East Asia, up to 40% with adenocarcinoma have such a mutation. The frequency of ALK gene rearrangements is quite lower. We did a study in Europe on patients with resected adenocarcinoma. Over 1,000 patients had their tumors. Of over 1,000 patients was examined. We did immunohistochemistry for the presence of the ALK gene, fusion gene, it was positive in about 6.3% of the patients, and then we confirmed this by the standardized approved FISH technique, which was positive in 2.1% of the patients. That showed us that ALK gene rearrangement is much rarer than we initially thought. It's in the range of 2 to 4% of some reports. And that also, of course, leads to the question, how should we examine patients with such a gene rearrangement? The FISH fluorescence in cytohybridization is quite a cumbersome technique, but it's the proof test, at least in the States, a companion diagnostic. FISH technique for screening would be much easier. And the debate now in the community is, should one do immunohistochemistry and confirmation by FISH, or should all patients be examined by FISH, despite that the frequency of finding a 
a positive rearrangement is only 2%. Now, as I said again, I showed you before the response rate to the crisotinib treatment. Also here, the progression-free survival with crisotinib versus chemotherapy on the green line was much superior than to chemotherapy alone. Now, I demonstrated to you the situation today. This is current reality. Now, the situation tomorrow will be much more complex. With adenocarcinoma, Besides EGFR mutations and ALK fusions, there are other genes that have been identified as oncogenic driver and will be important already or will be important in the future for patient selection for treatment. The recommendations currently in Switzerland and many European countries is as follows. Patients with non squamous cell lung cancer should be subtyped. Patients with Adenocarcinoma or non squamous cell lung cancer should have an EGFR mutation analysis. If this is negative, then one should do an EGFR ALK gene rearrangement. And here, for example, in Zurich, if this is still negative, we do a BRAF mutation analysis and a HER2 mutation analysis. Why? HER2 has been demonstrated to be an oncogenic driver. There's drugs available to target HER2, either tastuzumab combined with chemotherapy. There have also been responses noted to afatinib, irreversible EGFR and HER2 inhibitor in patients who have HER2 mutated tumor. So the drugs are here. The patients are rare but can be identified and might profit from such a treatment. However, I think in most countries this treatment is not yet approved by the regulatory authorities, but in some countries, patients can have access to. BRF mutations have been demonstrated in 60% of melanoma. Drugs have been developed against BRF mutated melanoma and have been shown to be quite effective for patients with advanced disease. Here just was a report from a Swiss colleague who demonstrated the activity of this drug against verumafenib, against BRAF mutated adenocarcinoma, very nicely with a PET CT response. So again, the question is, in the near future, should we also test routinely HER2 and BRAF in our patients? There have been reports that the drug crisotinib is also active with another gene rearrangement against ROS1. ROS1 fusion positive tumors have been identified by fish, again, in a very small proportion of non squamous cell lung cancer, in about 1 to maybe maximum 2%. But clinically, responses have been reported. And red gene rearrangement has also been identified against by fish analysis, and there are drugs multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors, for example, vandetinib, which are directed against red fusion genes and which have been found in an occasional case to be active with adenocarcinoma of the lung. So the picture that is emerging is quite complex. I would like to summarize the findings as follows. Personalized treatment for advanced non small cell lung cancer has become a new reality. As of today, up to one-third of lung adenocarcinomas in Western societies seem to have an actionable oncogenic mutation or gene rearrangement with approved therapies, EGFR and ALK, or therapies at least under investigation. A similar picture might emerge in lung squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this multitude of potential actionable molecular changes must lead to a change in diagnostic workup. We cannot continue with sequential testing, but we need to institute multiplex testing and next generation sequencing for the future work of the patient's tumors. Now, key issues to resolve in the future are patient access to molecular testing and targeted agents, regulatory issues, how those new drugs can be approved in a rapid way. As I said before, we need to deal with drug resistance and how this can be overcome. We need to find out how targeted therapy can be applied in earlier stage of disease. 
Now, all this can only be done if the community approves that we need just molecular testing, not just the diagnosis, but also a successful time point during treatment at that, the time of relapse. Thank you. And with this, I'd like to give back to you, John. Ralph, thank you for that detailed presentation and for actually setting the stage for further discussion about the move in medicine towards more personalized treatments in oncology. If you're just now joining our webinar, welcome. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be conducting a Q&A segment following the panelists' presentations. Please type your question for any or all of our panelists into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. Our second panelist, Dr. Martin Edelman, will now begin his presentation. He's going to pick up on some of the points made by Rolf and then provide his own insights on the optimization of current and future drugs for the treatment of advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Martin? Thank you, John. I'm going to talk about other aspects of personalization of therapy in advanced non-small cell lung cancer, specifically an optimization of current and future drugs, as well as some settings that were not discussed by others. So in the first slide over here, you know, we've seen that personalization of therapy is clearly applicable for non-squamous carcinoma, specifically histology, the non-squamous histology, and use of bevacizumab and pemetrexid, DNA sequencing for the EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and perhaps for red inhibitors as well, and the use of FISH testing for EML4, ALEC, and ROS1 for crizotinib. However, as everybody knows, that just represents a minority of non-small cell lung cancer and does not address the fact that virtually all advanced non-small cell lung cancer will relapse and require additional therapy. Let's not forget that the median time to progression for allotinib or crizotinib is only about 10 months, even in the population that demonstrates a mutation or translocation, respectively. So most current approaches don't assess for tumor heterogeneity or require tissue. So. What about personalization for the diseases without drugs or for the drugs that already exist, you know, other than the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, as well as for certain drugs in development? And I'm going to discuss aspects of targeted therapy for squamous carcinoma, for cytotoxics, real-time assessment for the presence of markers for susceptibility and resistance, and give the example of nuclear medicine imaging, look at the upcoming field of personalization for immunotherapy, an area of great excitement now in non-small cell lung cancer as well as perhaps the use of personalization for toxicity prevention or at least anticipation. In squamous cell carcinoma, the last year has seen an enormous amount of knowledge emerge as far as new molecular targets in squamous cell carcinoma, specifically genes such as SOX2, FGFR, and DDR2 are frequently mutated in this disease and for which inhibitors are currently either in development or existing drugs may potentially be efficacious. However, at this time, there are no studies that demonstrate any clear efficacy for the use of these drugs in non small cell lung cancer, even with these markers. However, this is an extremely promising area for a major aspect of non-small cell lung cancer. It's important to note that none of these are truly actionable at this time. A lot of people use that phrase, but to me, no finding or mutation or marker is actionable until you can actually write a prescription for an approved agent. What about personalization of cytotoxic therapy? I think that these are effective agents. We know that we can use, for example, platinum-based therapy for the curative therapy of lung cancer in stage three disease, for the adjuvant therapy, which effectively is an increase in curative treatment in stage one and two disease. So clearly there are very effective agents. However, we would like to use more sophisticated approaches. We already know that histology is useful and you know, perhaps there are some molecular variables. And then there are new and improved cytotoxics, which I won't discuss, such as agents that are new molecules for the same targets or new molecules targeting different areas of older targets. So one of the areas that's gotten a lot of interest over the last few years is the use of the ERCC1 expression as a way of selecting patients for cisplatinum therapy. 
since platinum cytotoxicity requires the creation of DNA adducts followed by covalent cross-linking between DNA strands. The excision of these adducts is an important determinant of cisplatinum efficacy. So if the cisplatinum adduct cannot be resected, by sized rather, by the cell, it will result in toxicity. And ERCC1 is one of the major determinants of whether or not the DNA can be repaired. And there's been a fair amount of evidence over the years from a variety of labs that has shown that low ERCC1 expression is associated with increased susceptibility to cisplatin. And similar results have been found with ribonucleotide reductase M1 subunit in that low levels of RRM1 are associated with better efficacy of gemcitabine. So the group at Moffitt, led by George Simon, a few years ago, performed what they called the MATED trial, where what they did is they evaluated tumors for low versus high RM1 and low versus high ERCC1 and selected chemotherapy based upon these determinants. They termed this the MATED trial. And what they found was very interesting was that compared to historical controls at the same institution, they seemed to have improved median or overall survival as well as improved landmark survival and response rate for this and demonstrated that there was overall feasibility for this approach, though it did require considerable infrastructure for the way that they determined ERCC1 and RM1 levels. However, this is yet to be demonstrated in a phase three setting. And as my next slide demonstrates, you know, one always has to be a little cautious about single center or even multi-center phase two studies, as can be seen with this and with the carbotaxol, you know, studies from the mid-1990s, where the result in the phase two study were much, much more effective than in the phase three, even though the investigators were essentially similar and the patients were supposedly similar as well. In addition, on the next slide shows why this is so that referral populations alone do generally tend to do better. These are results in head and neck cancer at the University of Chicago, where one of the major determinants of outcome was how far you live from the University of Chicago. So again, all of these results need to be taken with a grain of salt. But the issue with ERCC1 and RM1 is very interesting, and this phase three study is, uh, to my understanding, currently underway, and the results, however, are not yet known. Another way in which an existing agent can be made better is in the example of pemetrexid, a drug that we already know is, seems to be more selectively active in non-squamous carcinoma. It was originally designed as a multi-targeted antifolate inhibiting thymidate synthetase, a dihydrofolate reductase, and GARFT. TS is involved in DNA biosynthesis, and it was felt that increased expression of TS would result in resistance to pemetrexid, and it seems to actually be the case, as can be seen on this slide, which is one of many studies that have shown that elevated TS levels tend to predict for poorer response to pemetrexid. However, again, there's been no demonstrated use of this in any prospective randomized study that shows that this is a way of actually selecting patients. So at this time, I've already shown three different determinants of sensitivity or resistance to existing cytotoxics, and there are several others. However, none has been validated and can be utilized in routine practice. And there are several reasons for this. For one thing, there are no standardized tests. While you can certainly send off to any number of reference labs and obtain ERCC1 expression, this is actually quite variable depending upon the antibody used. It may not be reproducible unless one is using the exact same antibody in the exact same setting. And again, no randomized control has yet demonstrated a benefit from this approach, but it is an exciting one and one that hopefully will continue to be exploited in the future. The use of nuclear imaging is, I think, a very interesting approach to selecting and personalizing therapy. And I'm going to give you the example from a drug that is currently in a randomized phase 3 setting in ovarian cancer and a randomized phase 2 setting in lung cancer, which is EC145, now known as vintefilide. This is a drug that targets the folate receptor, which is overexpressed in malignant cells, particularly in ovarian cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, head and neck, and others. A drug called EC145 has been developed, which combines a folate molecule, a linker, and a vinca alkaloid. A tracer molecule is very similar to this, and it's a folate, a linker, and a technetium-99 molecule that allows for imaging, with the idea that if you inject in the tracer first and it takes up in the areas of disease, that this will be associated with activity. In other words, a real-time, non-invasive approach to determining the presence of a target. 
And this is the basis of current studies, such, for example, in this randomized phase two study, patients cannot be entered unless they demonstrate uptake on the technetium scan. So this is an approach, again, still experimental and currently under evaluation, but it may be a way to personalize therapy and something that can be used with drugs that are currently in development. Immunotherapy has taken a lot of interest since last year's ASCO meeting. In particular, PD-1 and its role in T-cell activation and anti-PD-1 molecules. PD-1 uh, is an inhibitor of dendritic cells and other cells that are responsible for anti-tumor immunity, and uh, immunity is upregulated when PD-1 is present, and it's ligand PD-L1. And so molecules that inhibit PD-1 or PD-L1 have been developed and now evaluated in a variety of clinical settings. So at ASCO last year, the results of one molecule were presented from an expanded phase one cohort, and what this demonstrated was a real response in metastatic chemotherapy refractory lung cancer, with some of these responses actually being quite durable. And on the next slide, you can see an example of actual shrinkage of disease in a patient who had had multiple prior chemotherapy regimens, as well as prior radiotherapy. And this is, drug is now the subject of a randomized phase three study to evaluate for its potential utility in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. What's interesting is that as part of some of the preliminary data on this is some examples that immunohistochemistry may be one way to evaluate for whether patients will respond or not. And there are the antibodies that have been developed for therapeutics can also be adapted for use in diagnostics to determine whether or not the antigen is present and whether or not the drugs can potentially be utilized. Again, this is something still in development, as is the drug itself, but maybe a potential way in which patients can be selected for use of anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-01 therapies. So in general, it is likely that these approaches will become validated. There are significant questions regarding the exact roles and how well these can be combined, and very importantly, whether or not therapy can actually be personalized based upon this testing. So lastly, let's discuss personalization and toxicity. This is, I think, a very interesting area because it involves germline analysis, and it's always easy to get germline DNA. And there is clear evidence that germline polymorphisms, particularly drug metabolism enzymes, can predict toxicity and also possibly outcome because if drugs are quickly detoxified, then they have limited ability to affect the tumor. And conversely, a drug that has a very slow metabolism in a certain group of patients may even have increased increased activity, but also perhaps increased toxicity. There have been a number of studies that have demonstrated between different populations using a common arm, most particularly the uh, studies done by the Southwest Oncology Group investigators led by Dr. Gandera that have demonstrated marked differences in toxicity and outcome in trials between the U.S. and Japan for commonly utilized agents such as the taxanes and arinotecan, and despite the same doses, same evaluation plans, and same toxicity grading. So so that is one area where we may be able to further personalize therapy by determining who is likely to get toxicity and perhaps even activity. For some of the newer drugs like sunitinib, there is a fair amount of evidence that certain cytochrome P450 enzymes may be associated with increased risks of toxicity and need for, for dose modifications. So this, is, again, is an emerging area which can allow for personalization of therapy, at least by reducing the risk of toxicity. So one thing I would have is a note of caution about personalization. We tend to look at things in a very unidimensional manner of, oh, the patient has this particular mutation and therefore will benefit from this drug. Well, that's certainly true for certain driver mutations, but it should be recognized that most colon, lung, and other carcinogen-associated epithelial cancers are exceedingly complex, far more complex than the hematologic malignancies like CML or childhood leukemias, and that these benefits are likely to be for only a fraction of the patients and only a fraction of the tumors. So over time, we're going to need to develop much more sophisticated and really multivariable approaches given the complexity of these diseases. I thank you for your attention. Back to you, John. Martin, much thanks for that outstanding presentation. You and Rolf have given our audience a timely and exquisitely detailed overview of the personalization of oncology therapy and specifically for advanced non-small cell lung cancer. 
Before we proceed, let me remind everyone of our Q&A segment that comes right after the panelists made their presentations. Please type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. Our third panelist, Dr. Yuri Nikolsky, is ready to talk about a range of methods for the functional analysis of omics data for personalized and translational medicine. Yuri? Thank you, John, for this introduction. What I would like to talk about today is a bunch of methods of system specific analysis, which we apply as a company for analysis of oncology data for personalized care. As Ralph and Martin nicely presented, currently there are very interesting markers for drug response in cancer. For instance, EGFR mutation for gifitinib in lung adenocarcinomas, RAS mutations for sarafenib, or BRAF V600 mutations for Zilberlaf. There are about 30 or 40 markers like this as far as we know, and we know just because we have pretty large databases of all gene variants, specifically in oncology. There are also good markers for cancer progression, for instance, 21 and 70 gene expression signature for breast cancers, which are currently under very long clinical trials. Uh, what's coming in the future, though, is much larger data sets, next generation sequencing for, first of all, uh, whole genome or exome sequencing for cancer genomes, which will pick up uh, different variants, mostly SNPs, but also amplification divisions, fusion genes, and most importantly, driver mutations for, for the cancers. Then there is RNA seq technology when the expression uh, profiles can be traced almost in a single uh, cell in cancer genomes, which is way more precise than microarray expression profiling. And finally, there is a lot of data coming of in code studies, so this is not protein coding genome, which is currently beginning to be understood, and at least 60% of our genome can be actually assigned to the function. So what we know about all these omics assays is that we can now have assays at the level of epigenetics, DNA, RNA, protein, and metabolites, and the level of complexity actually diminishes from DNA. That's where we have mostly signaling and all the possible mutations driving the cancer progression to RNA when we see how these genes are expressed. It's already a subset, and then level of protein and eventually the level of metabolites. So what we know about this omics data, several things actually. First, not a single level data can provide substantial markers of substantial power and accuracy to describe cancer progression drug response. And that was shown in raw presentation, for instance. You need to go deeper and look at very different mutations and other alterations. The next thing that we know is that when you assay the cancers at a different level, for instance, you have mutation genes and you have amplifications, you have expression, the gene level doesn't give you potential overlap. So the genes which are picked up by different tests uh, simply don't overlap very well. And you can actually apply only statistical methods for uh, correlating between different data types. So what needs to be done is area of knowledge known as uh, systems biology applied by analysis, and that's an engine to really understand omics uh, data sets, correlate them together, and apply in translational research. So for me, the real era of systems biology started probably from the Hartwell paper on HEPAP in 1999 when he proposed that the cell biology actually needs to be understood at the level of modules because proteins work in group and complexes and the pathways. So on the next slide shows how we can actually see this level of connectivity between the proteins and all the modules. So first of all, proteins interact. We just know that some genes would be co-expressed, or you can pick up protein interactions by different methods. It can be a bit more sophisticated if we just analyze the literature and come up with a database of protein interactions from small experiments. In such a case, we know which proteins are there, which functions. For instance, now we know that the receptors and ligands, kinases, signal transduction cascades, transcription factor receptor genes. We also know that interactions can be positive and negative. And we also know that there are very different types of interactions, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, for instance, transcription regulation, and so on, more than 20 different types. So the next level of organization for interactions is the pathways. As the first cancer resequencing, exome resequencing project shown, when you see the alterations in cancer genomes, mostly at the level of pathways, not at the level of individual genes. So this is some of the highlights from science papers by Bert Wagelstein lab, which started publishing this in 2007 and 2008, and looked at multiple cancer genome, glioblastoma, breast and colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, 
medulloblastom and so on. So in all these cases and all these cancers, the heterogeneity at the level of driver mutation was very high, probably 100 to 200 mutations, driver mutations for cancer. But they all been situated in a certain number of pathways, which are known as Wigglestein pathways. So the signaling pathways can be presented as linear chains of protein interactions starting usually with ligand receptor, then signal transduction cascades, then transcription factors and first level regulation. There are probably about 300 pathways like this, and we should annotate it probably about 200,000, 250,000 of them. And the pathways form larger structures, which we call pathway maps, kind of file diagrams, which show the crosstalk between them. So now, when we have the tools such as protein interaction and pathways, we can be a bit more sophisticated than just statistical analysis in putting together different types of omics data in cancer. So this slide shows that we can apply multiple tools. One tool is synergy in enrichment analysis. We look for the pathway maps and for the process we would have, let's say, mutations and amplifications and expression, overexpressed genes together. Then we can look at overconnected genes, look, for instance, for transcription factors which are mutated, which would have a large number of overexpressed or underexpressed genes, and that's how we can trace the gain of function mutation for the proteins. We can also look at higher level organization, look for hidden nodes, two or three uh, steps from transcription regulation, and uh, then we can build structures known as uh, causal networks, which take into account the pathways. So our next slide shows how we do topological scoring. Let's say we have a list of overexpressed genes in a certain cancer, then we can calculate first-level regulation, like in this case it would be an FKB, which is overconnected transcription factor. Then we can reconstruct using the interaction database and pathways the upstream regulation for an FKB and come up with beta receptor and TGF beta ligand. In some cases, these regulators like an FKB can be overexpressed itself. In some cases, it can be mutated. Or in some cases, nothing happens. But still, these genes are extremely important as the key regulators. So how we use it? Well, it's shown in the next slide. This is one of our actual examples of how we can up, come up with mechanism of resistance and sensitivity for cancer drugs uh, in clinical trials. So uh, this is from a project with a pharmaceutical company. So we can use the knowledge of pathways and interactions to reconstruct the structures which should contain ligand receptors, the key pathways from the collection of pathways in a certain mechanistic way. So there would be different networks for resistance and sensitivity, and the gene content of these networks can be used actually as a marker uh, for uh, patient certification. So the next slide shows another example how the very same technology can be applied for personalized cancer treatment. In this case, we had a pancreatic cancer, the actual case, came up with a set of differentially expressed genes, 276 of them, and used our knowledge of interactions and pathways to build an individual causal model or individual causal network. Then we did some analysis and scoring of the key nodes on this model to come up with the most important proteins to be targeted by combination therapy. So in this case, it was AGF receptor and TGF beta as a potential target. So now I'd like to switch gears and talk about another big development that we've been working on for about seven years. It's called MetaMiner, and the idea here was to reconstruct disease biology for selected diseases as deeply as possible with current knowledge of you know, disease biology. So essentially, the pathways which we had are normal pathways. They involved, of course, in cancers, but you really need to go deeper and look at what happens when you have, uh, for instance, fusion proteins or mutated proteins, how they change the form of the shape of the pathways and how pathology pathways would be different from normal ones. So we worked on several disease areas in oncology. We had the project for three years with some pharmaceutical companies, also Johns Hopkins and uh, Harvard and uh, Tijan and uh, Van Andel uh, Institute. So we completed work on eight cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, gastric cancer, pancreatic, multiple myeloma, lung, breast, colorectal, and melanoma. For all of these cancers, we drew at least 25 pathway maps, in some cases more. We annotated a number of genes which would have alteration at, gene, at DNA, RNA, or protein level. In total, more than 6,000 genes would be involved here, and they would have more than 16,000 variants which are associated with uh, all these cancers. The next slide shows how it can be used, all this knowledge, for visualization and also quantitatively. 
So this is a map for zinc deficiency in prostate cancer, a very well-known phenomenon. Concentration of zinc normally very high in prostate. In case of cancer, it goes back to normal. So this is prostate cancer cell. You can see the nucleus. You can see the mitochondria, ITCA mitochondria, and a bunch of proteins which would be connected to interactions of different type and different effect. So this is mechanistic level. It just describes what happens with the deficiency. So on the next slide, you can see that some of the genes and some of the compounds and mitochondria would have alterations in case of cancer. For instance, SLC transporter is underexpressed and the protein abundance is low. If you look at MMP9 metalloprotease, there are SNPs and it's also overexpressed in case of cancer and so on. What we can annotate here is a bunch of alterations or variants at DNA, RNA, and protein level, put them in the table, and then visualize on the pathway maps. So this is what we call the causal view of the very same pathway map. So now everything is deemed, but you see the genes and compounds which would have alterations in case of prostate cancer. So how this can be used? Well, uh, the next slide shows what we call the molecular portrait for a cancer. In this case, it's multiple myeloma, and we have a number of pathways specifically annotated and depicted and drawn for multiple myeloma. And then we have a biomarkers which are mapped on them, and the more biomarkers, the lower p-value for the pathway map. For instance, most biomarkers in this case would be on the map for DNA methylation and progression of multiple myeloma, and the second one would be for inhibition of apoptosis in multiple myeloma. So now we have about 25 pathway maps which are ranked based on the number of biomarkers on them, and this can be used as a descriptor on itself and applied in patient certification, for instance, in case of melanoma. So it's well known that variants and genetic alterations concentrated on the pathways, just as it was shown in the first sequencing. And in order to understand a like, large number of variants, what they mean, first you need to focus them on the pathways. And it makes perfect sense. You can have very high heterogeneity at the level of genes, but if the genes map on the same pathways, on the same networks, the network itself becomes cryptor for, for drug response, for instance. So eventually, we can barcode, in a sense, pretty much any cancer or even other diseases or toxicities and represent them as a quantitative list of normal pathways and pathology pathways, which can be ranked by the number of variants and biomarkers. And these barcodes can be used for drug repurposing, for our drug target identification and personalized medicine. So this is how we look at the diseases now. So we have about 2,000 diseases here and about 1,500 of pathway maps, and the diseases are clustered based on the pathways. So it's known that diseases really share the same pathology. For instance, inflammation will be found in pretty much all the cancers and many other diseases. So how it can work? Well, we can apply the pathways or the causal networks built for patient certification, for instance. So in this case, we can look at individual mutations, just as was described today by Martin and Rolf. Then it can be something like expression markers. We can have other genetic alteration as well. So the pathways which are affected the most can be used as a basis for protein specification. So I would like to stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. And Yuri, thank you very much. And thank you, Rolf. And Martin, you've all done a great job in showing how the use of data from next generation sequencing and from various omics techniques is changing the therapeutic paradigms for the treatment of disease. And it's also rapidly ushering us into the era of personalized medicine. Thank you all for doing such a great job. We received many thoughtful questions from our audience, so uh, let's get started with our Q&A segment session. And Rolf, we have the first question for you. Uh, has chemotherapy become obsolete for the treatment of lung cancer? In no way. You know, chemotherapy does provide tumor regression, prolongation of life, improved quality of life, and what we have here with the new targeted treatment adds on. So we have an additional benefit, which may be better than chemotherapy, but still, for the foreseeable future, chemotherapy is there to stay. And another question, Rolf. Uh, 
Which is, in your opinion, the applicability in everyday clinical practice of multiplex testing and NGS? Which strategy would you propose to overcome possible financial and logistic difficulties? Well, I, I can, you know, say from our hospital how we do that. Multiplex testing is this year being instituted, and the calculations of my colleagues in pathology where the work is done is that they think they can provide much more information for the same amount of money and as we, when we do just the sequential EGFR mutation, ELK, FISH, BRAF, and uh, HER2 mutation. However, this first needs to be implemented this year, and how will it will turn out in practice, we don't know yet. And, Rolf, how critical is early detection of acquired resistance in the context of drug resistance treatment adaptation? Well, we, the most data we have is from patients who have an EGFR mutated tumor treated with an EGFR TKI. And here, the, the thing is in flux. Currently, it's quite accepted that even patients who have demonstrable T790M mutation at diagnosis still respond to the targeted agent. So uh, the resistance development will really, the, to overcome resistance, we will need to have research based on rebiopsies of tumor that grow under treatment and then very specific clinical trials to address that the very tiny subgroups that where we feel the resistance is driven by a certain mechanism. So this will not be an easy task. And Ralph, I'll give you a chance to get your breath because we have another question for you. Uh, which treatment would you propose to a 65-year-old female ECOG PSO patient with a stage four adenocarcinoma carrying an exon 21 EGFR activating mutation and also an ALK translocation? Well, this is an interesting question because of, uh, a few years ago we all felt EGFR mutation and ALK rearrangements are mutually exclusive. And more and more it's found that is not the case. So we know co-expression of different drivers can exist. But for this patient, I would go by what has been demonstrated best. And I would go for an EGFR-targeted treatment, a relapse, chemotherapy, and then a relapse again, go to the ALK agent. And, Ralph, is the reason for a high frequency, 49%, uh, a secondary mutation on T790 EGFR? Well, uh, the current thinking is, that T790M mutation cells with carrying this mutation are probably present at most of the patients at the time of diagnosis, just a very small load, so they're not detected. And those cells are less sensitive to the targeted treatment. So why the cells that are sensitive to the targeted treatment undergo apoptosis, the cells carrying the mutation grow out. And this is why at a certain time, after a while of treatment, you find a higher percentage of cells with T790M mutation. And, Rolf, to what extent have private practitioners used results from literature to treat their client patients with off-label diagnostics and drug treatments? Are practicing physicians expressing a grassroots need for personalized medicine? Well, where I practice in Switzerland, yes, but you have to know we don't here have here off-label diagnostics because in Europe you don't need a companion diagnostics for a certain treatment. And, uh, but private practitioners or oncology groups, they also use generally our university hospital laboratories to perform the molecular testing, and they draw their conclusion. They may have less easy access to drugs which are not registered, but I'm sure they're trying the same. Thank you, Ralph. And Martin, why don't you pick up with that question as well? because somebody asked that of you. Uh, to what extent have private practitioners used results from literature to treat their client patients with off-label diagnostics and drug treatments? Are practicing physicians indeed expressing a grassroots need for personalized medicine? Well, I think everybody wants to have um, a better way to select therapy. Um, 
right now, actually, you could say that um, you know EGFR mutation testing is not part of the any uh, of the label for any drug in the United States. Um, you know, which we have you know at this time one, which is erlotinib, but certainly that has been uh, adopted fairly widely, and the test is is pretty easily available. Uh, many university centers run it in house. Uh, it certainly is easily commercially available, and you know if you have an adequate specimen, can you can have turnaround in you know a week or less at many places. And similarly for EML4 ALK, where you know that that is part of the label. When you go beyond that to things like uh, you know ERCC1 or RM1, um, there it's these are certainly avail commercially available tests. But as I think I you know had in my talk, I, I really don't believe that they're ready for prime time. People get this. I think that they use it, but I don't think that they adequately understand the limitations of these tests. In particular, uh, many of the papers with ERCC1, the results um, even from the, the same groups are not uh, reproducible at this time. So I think that uh, uh, they're not ready for prime time. But, you know, clearly right now EGFR and EML4, ALEC unquestionably can guide therapy. Okay, Martin, a question that was directed to Rolf before, another one was also directed to you. Which treatment would you propose to a 66-year-old female ECOGPS0 patient with a stage 4 adenocarcinoma carrying an exon 21 EGFR activating mutation and also an ALK translocation? So the first thing I would say with this is that the EGFR mutation technology is uh, more robust than some of the FISH testing in the sense that it's less prone to error and, um, you know, you can be pretty certain that if it comes back with an EGFR mutation, it's really there. The ALK translocation is by FISH, and um, there are clearly some operator issues with that. And, you know, what the uh, questioner didn't provide was, well, what's the percentage of cells? Because it, it's, you know, the way that it's actually set up is it has to be greater than 15%. I have seen a false positive with this, so I completely agree with ALK. With, with Rolf, I would certainly start with the EGFR mutation. I think what I might differ a little bit is upon progression, I would want to re-biopsy and see what happens. We've now seen some cases, for example, of patients who initially were tested negative for everything and then would have EML4 ALK emerge and have excellent responses to crozotinib. So, in, you know, I, I think that it's not so much that the cells are expressing both abnormalities, but there may be different populations of cells. But I would have nothing, you know, I, I think my standard paradigm paradigm for approaching patients is when they do develop resistance is to go to a, a pemetrexid platinum regimen and then, um, you know, and then after that, again, is, is I would be rebiopsying from time to time uh, if, if easily available and if the, you know, the uh, uh, evidence sort of supports that. And then, you know, if, particularly in this situation where there's this question of an email for al clone and if that becomes the predominant clone to then treat with crizotinib. And Martin, what can the United States do to catch up with Europe on availability of these personalized therapies? For example, the willingness to approve and pay for such therapies. Well, I, I think that all of these treatments are approved uh, in the United States. In fact, approvals for agents are faster now than in Europe. So that's you know that that was recently reported. Um, so I, I'm not sure that this represents a true understanding of of what actually is happening here. There's no question that you know one's insurance. Uh, uh, you know what will be paid for varies state by state, um, and and the degrees of co-pays. And you know this has been a, a subject of um, some legislation. I actually testified here in Maryland about parity for payment of drugs with their IV or oral because those fall under different insurance uh, programs. Uh, the testing again is widely available, um, and and actually usually paid for uh, without much difficulty these days. So you know there's clearly um, issues of payment, but no no questions regarding availability. And, and even within Europe, uh, things vary country by country, uh, even within the EU. And Martin, which are the most appropriate clinical trial designs that can address the personalized treatment strategy? 
Well, I think there's a lot of different designs that are out there, you know, as as one, you know, tries to advance this. And there are designs that are, you know, for early in investigation. So, for example, um, you know, where you may include, let's say, that you have a drug that you think you know the target, but, you know, who knows, maybe broadly applicable, where, you know, you're going to even search for a dose, but at the same time, you know, one should obtain tissue and test for specific uh, populations and then, you know, as one, you know, hits your, your dose and expands it, you can expand it in a specific population, very similar to what happened with crizotinib. You then may have something that's hypothesized as a, um, as a marker for sensitivity or resistance. So, for example, um, we had thought that beta tubulin-3 uh, expression would be a marker for potential benefit from um, uh in, in lung cancer. And so we did a study that would enter all patients but where the actual outcome was uh, they, they were randomized between uh, a carbo versus carbotaxol, and the ultimate uh, endpoint depended upon whether or not you had beta tubulin 3 expression, but it allowed for evaluation of all patients, which sort of simplified, you know, some of the degree of, of getting patients on studies and also allowed to assess for activity in both the presumed sensitive versus insensitive population. So it turned out it didn't work for either that, that or, you know, it didn't, didn't show any tremendous benefits over uh, the standard regimen that papers in press in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. So a lot depends upon on the nature of the marker and where you are in your testing, you know, clearly the most definitive, you know, approach is to, um, you know, have the, you know, have the marker and then stratify, you know, and then randomize patients to either receive a standard therapy or the, um, uh, the, the uh, therapy based upon the marker. So, for example, the recent, there have been now five studies that have randomized EGFR mutated patients between chemotherapy and an EGFR uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And Martin, do you think physicians would appreciate the biomarker test results to make clinical decisions for targeted therapy in the countries where the tests are not yet approved, uh, not approved yet for clinical decisions? And do you think private companies should have an, an interest here? Well, you know, once again, I think that the there really only are two tests at the moment that clearly guide your therapy, um, you know, in an unequivocal fashion. That's EGFR, you know, mutation testing to select for the early use or, of erlotinib. And even there, you know, the the fact is is that is the the key issue there is that the patients get exposed to the drug because there's so much crossover that you don't show so much an overall survival advantage, but there's clearly a progression-free and I think symptom um, um, uh, improved symptoms or less toxicity associated with the earlier rather than the later use of that drug, uh, and then again EML4 alk for crizotinib. Um, you know the other tests that I discussed are really not ready for prime time, but are really things that are emerging and areas that one should should maintain interest in. You know, clearly industry has an interest in this because they think that, you know, if one can show, you know, both sort of uh, that, that a drug can be optimized in a population from, say, efficacy or toxicity viewpoints, that's clearly uh, something that's of benefit. Um, you know, and I think that we've seen some precedent for this, for example, in the use of histology to decide whether or not to use pemetrexin. I think that, uh, uh, you know, the manufacturer, to its credit, actually surrendered part of their indication in, uh, in the second-line setting, you know, from a broad indication in lung cancer to only non-squamous uh, and got the front-line indication as well in non-squamous carcinoma, even though they probably could have successfully applied uh, based upon their trial results for a broad indication. But by restricting it to uh, non-squamous carcinoma, uh, it's, it's clearly a, a a better treatment. Thank you, Martin. Very, very detailed. Yuri, question. How do you validate network pathways? Uh, well, uh, the best way, of course, uh, to validate uh, in uh, wet lab and uh, uh, eventually probably in um, uh, animal, uh, in graft, uh, animals. Uh, so um, uh, we have uh, uh, for instance, uh, a study with the uh, Translational Genomics uh, Institute, uh, TGEN, uh, on glioblastoma, where we predicted uh, targets for uh, glioblastoma and uh, ranked them by importance. And uh, uh, now uh, this work will continue with development of assays and uh, actual 
uh, validation of this target, and uh, that, is, that goes for different subtypes of uh, um, glioblastoma. Uh, uh, also, there are pathway-based assays uh, which have been developed in pharmaceutical companies for uh, quite some time. And uh, then there are uh, more uh, indirect methods. Uh, for instance, uh, when you have expression profile, you can uh, calculate concordance and discordance uh, by uh, upstream regulators on the network uh, just by knowing the uh, effect uh, of uh, uh, signaling and uh, the uh, result, which would be differentially expressed genes. Hey, Yuri, before asking the next question, this is directed to the audience. Right now, a survey is popping up on your screen. We would very much appreciate your feedback on this webinar. Uh, kindly give us your thoughts, as this will help us to continue to bring you topical and timely webinars in the future. So we really appreciate it if you'd uh, take that survey. Thank you. So, Yuri, how do you know a network is causal? Uh, well, um, uh, causality is... Uh, uh, embodied in the structure of the network. So the network uh, actually starts with uh, triggers, continues through signal transaction cascades, and uh, eventually uh, uh, ends up on transcription factors activating uh, the effector genes. So uh, that's how signal proceeds. Uh, each step uh, has uh, its direction and uh, effect, so you can calculate uh, the summarized effect. Uh, but uh, causality in terms of disease, uh, well, it's just a hypothesis. So uh, each network, when uh, it's drawn uh, out of data and out of interaction, it's just uh, a hypothesis which needs to be validated. Thank you. And Yuri, how does barcode phenotyping work in the discovery of unknown causes? It seems like known variables would guide the scoring, ranking, etc. Uh, well, that's, uh, that, that's our research. Uh, so uh, barcoding, for instance, can be uh, used for uh, subtypes of the disease uh, in quantitative manner. Um, well, uh, we, we are working on it. And Yuri, as next generation sequencing gets adopted in the clinical environment, how do you see the testing algorithm to change? H&E staining, NGS next, and then IHC testing, of the area of interest. Isn't heterogeneity lost with sequencing? Uh, I would start probably with the uh, second question. Uh, I don't think it's lost. Uh, I think next generation sequencing uh, just makes analysis more precise. Uh, uh, pretty soon it will be uh, possible to do sequencing from uh, probably my single cell. And uh, right now uh, in a cancer sample, uh, you can uh, actually test uh, different sites uh, just to see uh, for instance, uh, uh, like uh, clonal selection. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, testing algorithm, uh, yes, I agree, uh, probably H -E staining and then uh, NGS. Well, this has been a very interesting webinar and some fascinating questions, but we've unfortunately run out of time. Uh, audience, please note that this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genangnews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, and you can recommend it to your colleagues and friends. Uh, thanks again to the panel for the outstanding presentations, and I want to say thank you to our audience for your attention and for your thoughtful questions about various topics brought up during the webinar, which has just been very well demonstrated. And thank you to our sponsor, Thomson Reuters, who made this event possible. Everybody have a great day.